Okay, well, um, last time we, um, we were talking about the books uh, from, from the exile time. And if you remember, I, I've been calling the exile time everything from the northern kingdom's exile on down to the end of the southern kingdom's exile. So I'm actually calling, you know, the period from 722 to 530s in there, um, the exile period. Um, so we, we stopped talking um, at Ezekiel. Um, so that takes us to First and Second Kings, which were both written supposing that Supposing that the information that First and Second Kings has was stopped where it was because that brought them up to history, it was written during the exile. And what I mean is this. Um, Second Kings ends with the people in exile. So with that being said, why would it stop there? You know what I mean? Um, and just the way, the way it, it says about how the the king's descendant was let out of prison and everything. It seems to be saying that it ended, that it was written in the time of the exile. Now, First and Second Chronicles, however, is going to be written um, after the exile when the people have already returned, and I'll talk about them in just a second. Um, so, first off, it, it was it may have been written by Jeremiah, but probably probably not. Um, there is no name attached to it in itself so um, but whatever it was it was written during the exile most likely um, its purpose was to answer why Israel and Judah fell you know it, it's not a history book it is actually a, a history commentary book it goes through all these kings and leaves off a lot of information about them and just pretty much goes on on the on the basis of was this person a spiritually good or bad person? You know, um, depending on what they did, what they believed, what they said, those kinds of things. Um, and, you know, after each of the kings, it says, now this person was bad and did, did fall in the ways of Israel or in the ways of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, or something like that. You know, it, it, it or it'll say that this king was good. Um, and then at the end, when Israel falls, it says, you know, now this is why it fell. And then it says, you know, why, why Judah fell and everything. Um, and, and so obviously it, it's trying to show... It tries to show the why as to Israel and Judah fell, which obviously is a very timely book, um, you know, since it was written during the exile to, to the exiles, um, you know. And, I mean, another reason why we can date it to that time is just because, you know, the message of it itself, its purpose is all about that. Um, so it picks up pretty much ex immediately after the events of, of Samuel. Um, so about 971, and it goes all the way down to about 550, somewhere in there. Um, it does not mention Cyrus the Persian. It does not mention any of that. So Babylon, we can assume, is still in power. Um, it does mention a number of sources, the Annals of Solomon, the Annals of Judah, and the Annals of Israel. Um, however, none of these books uh, were preserved. God didn't want us to know the history of it. He wanted us to know... Um, he wanted us to, to know more than just history. He wanted us to know why did this happen. He wanted us to know, you know, what can we learn from this. Uh, that, that's kind of an important deal. A lot of times when, we're, when, we're, when we read the historical books of the Old Testament, we get this idea that God wants us to know all the historical details. and So, so we start asking the text things. What happened here? What's this? What's this? And we start forming theories based off of something that the Bible doesn't even talk about. Because it wasn't an issue back then. Like, for instance, does the, does the Bible talk about evolution? No. You know, some people have said, oh, between verse 1 and verse 2, it's saying about, you know, how there was a, an old earth and it was recreated and there's a new earth or whatever. Well, although that, that could have happened, I suppose, the Bible's not commenting on that one way or another. Um, so once again, it's not important that you don't read into it. Find out what it is actually trying to teach of itself. Um, First and Second Kings reflects strongly on the warnings of Deuteronomy. Um, Deuteronomy, if you remember, has that list of if you do this, this will happen. If you don't do this, this will happen. And um, and, and and Kings reflects strongly on that. Um, and uh, it also um, is is the only book I believe in the Old Testament to record um, what Elijah and Elisha's ministries were. Um, I, I know that some other books mention Elijah and Elisha, but I believe that 
um, first and second kings are the only ones that um, really record specific stories and whatnot. Um, so, uh, Elijah and Elisha are very much so uh, mirrors, I guess you could say, of Moses and Joshua. If you remember, um, Elijah, you know, the, the whole uh, crossing the river thing is repeated, you know, it just, I really don't want to get into this too much, but um, the, the character of Moses and Joshua is, is contrasted with the character of Elijah and Elisha. Um, or I, I should say that the reverse. Elijah and Elisha are contrasted with Moses and Joshua. And if you read through there, pay attention to Elijah and Elisha's, what they say and what they do, and just kind of the settings of what's going on, and then compare it to what happened with Moses and Joshua, and uh, you'll see you know, some, some things there. Um, but one one of the four examples of that, um, it would be the way that um, they cross the the water with the stick and all that. So, um, some people see history and they say it's cause and effect, and a lot of times maybe that is true. And a lot of times, you know, just because God allows something doesn't mean He causes something every time. If that makes sense. Um, so a lot of times in history, sometimes things just happen. Sometimes things are caused. You know, and, and, and so with first and saying kings, he makes it abundantly clear that this is not something that just happened. This is something that was divine revelation. God himself caused Israel and Judah to fall because they were sinful. See, and, and, and so uh, regardless of what your opinion is, I know a lot of people get really carried away on that and they start to say stuff like, well, what about New Orleans? Well, no comment on that, but point being, we don't know about New Orleans and we do know about this. This was caused because um, God was carrying out judgment, just like He told His prophets that He was going to. Okay, there's another thing about the whole New Orleans thing. Why didn't God give a warning before? So could have been Him. Maybe there were were warnings that we just didn't hear about. Um, but you know. So a little outline here: the kingdom under Solomon in the first eleven chapters, the divided kingdom. Um, in, in chapter 12 all the way through the end of Second Kings. Now, uh, the divided kingdom, how it's broken up is into three subsections. The first is disunity, where, where the north and the south are fighting together. Then there's peace between them in chapter 16 of First Kings all the way to Second Kings not, chapter 9. And then once again, there's disunity in chapter 10 of Second Kings. And then uh, in 17, Israel Israel falls, and Judah is left all alone for chapters 18 through 25, and then it falls. Um, now, remember, over 100 years, I think it's somewhere around like 150 years, are covered in just 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, and just that many ch chapters. And that's, you know, um, the end of, of, of Judah, it, it, and, and it's just simple, you know, eight, eight simple chapters. So uh, the reasons um, that, that they fell was first off, I'm sorry, not, not that they fell. The reason why Judah was left longer was first off um, because they were in covenant with the Lord. That's David's heirs. Um, second off, uh, they were more righteous in a sense. Now, let me give a little bit of a qualifier for that. Um, Joash and um, Hezekiah and uh, was it Josiah? Well, anyways, there were a few kings throughout uh, throughout Judah's history that tried to reform, at least in part, okay? And because they were doing this and trying to stir the people back to God, it postponed the wrath, if you will. Um, and even Manasseh, you know, is recorded in Chronicles that he repented, and he was the most wicked king of Judah. Um, in, in, you know, uh, but it says that even that wasn't enough. Um Uh, another thing is um, Judah was allowed to return when Israel was not. Um, the the amount of people that returned to Israel was a small fragment, really, of what was there once upon a time. Um, also, you have to remember that there were prophets that were not recorded and some prophets that were only briefly referenced to. Um, for instance, those in, in the books of Kings. So... Um, Good enough on that. Some themes um, is the role of the prophets and the covenant faithfulness. You can um, see that throughout the book. Um, First Kings, for instance, in chapter uh, 16, 
23 through 28, um, says, in the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri became king over Israel and reigned 12 years. He reigned six years at Terza. He bought the hill at Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver, which is where Samaria comes from. And he built on the hill and named the city which he built Samaria after the name of Shemar, the owner of the hill. Um, Omri did uh, evil in the sight of the Lord. And it goes on just a little bit longer and then just says Ahab. And then it just hops down to Ahab. Omri was one of the most politically... Um, politically um, successful kings of Israel, and yet he's only briefly mentioned. Um, and then at the end of it, what does it say in verse, I think it's 28, So Ami slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria, and Ahab his son became king in his place. Oh, right here, in chapter, verse 27. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? In other words, this the point of this book is not to detail every act that's been done by this man, but just to talk just to talk about specific um, specifically. So uh, obviously, it's it's concerned with the role of the prophets and the covenant faithfulness. Um, we also see Solomon's failure, um, you know, uh, which is which is really funny because the Book of Kings really looks treats everybody very. Um, Harshly, very harshly, and obviously, you know, they, they, their homeland has just been taken from them, you know, and uh, trying to wake the people back to to um, their religious roots. But you know, still. Uh, so in First Kings ten twenty three through eleven eight, it's talking about all these things that Solomon has has done and is doing and everything, um, and then it sounds like he's praising him further. And it says about how uh, he had you know this house for the Pharaoh's daughter. How he had, um, uh, how he made silver and gold so plentiful. How he had so many wives and concubines. How he um, got these. I don't know if I said this already, but the horses uh, from Egypt shipped in, and how he had all this stuff. And if you look at it, it's actually mirroring the warnings from Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 17, 16 through 17, uh, Moses writes and says, "Now." The, you don't don't do this. Don't don't go back to Egypt for for horses. Don't go back to Egypt at all. Don't accumulate for yourselves wives. You know don't don't do all these things. And um, you know then then if you compare that with the account of First Kings, it's obvious that the writer of First Kings is contrasting with what Moses had said earlier. So. Um, I already mentioned this, but the defiling of the holy, for instance, the city of Bethel. If you read about Bethel in Genesis 12, 8, and 28, 10 through 19, and then read about it in 1 Kings 12, 25 through 33, you'll see once again the things that were once holy treated as profane, which is going to be mirroring the fact that the people of Israel were once holy and are now profane. Um, obviously, teaching things by images. So, um, in, in fact, there are some things that are in the Old Testament, in large part, to teach people, um, to teach people object lessons, um, something that that we wouldn't, people wouldn't understand otherwise. Um, so that takes us to who are the, who are some of these gods? Baal is one of the key ones that's mentioned a lot. He's a god of storm and fertility. Now, obviously, if he's the god of storm and fertility, he's he's going to be. Um, he's going to be something that, that, that's heavily dependent on in their worship. Um, you know, with the crops, with, you know, children and that kind of stuff. I mean, obviously, you'd want to get them good graces with that one. Um, but it, it, it's, it's funny because in the, st in the story of Elijah, where he calls down fire, or he prays to the Lord, and the Lord sends uh, fire down from heaven. Um, this is kind of funny because... Um, you know, the god of storm couldn't do this, and yet Elijah prays to, you know, Yahweh, and it happens. And Asherah, I mentioned this before, we don't really know who Asherah is. I mean, people have different views or whatever, unless, you know, there's been new research on this. But um, Asherah is pretty much, um, in a lot of in the different Canaanite religions, um, remember I said Can in, Canaan in Canaanite, they didn't have necessarily one set religion, they just kind of have variations throughout the different parts of Canaan. Um... And so she appears as different people. It seems likely that she's possibly the spouse of El, the mother of Bel. So El and Ashira, you know, had El. I'm sorry, had uh, Bel. Um, you know, but once again, it's kind of vague on that. So the Ashira poles are it seems like some kind of cultic, 
cultic thing that they'd worship, um, just like the high places. Um, so uh, Jezebel becomes a symbol of evil, just like Babylon. Um, she's mentioned there in 1 Kings 16.31. And it says, it came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the city of Nebat, that he married Je Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Sidonians, and went to serve Bel and worshipped him. So he erected an altar for Bel in the house of Bel, which he built in Samaria. Um, so also we see that God is faithful, a, a, a very, very important thing that, that strands all throughout. You know, he could have destroyed them. Long before he didn't even have to give them the opportunity of salvation, he didn't even have to make people in general. Um, and yet, you know, the Lord said to him, "I have heard your prayers and your supplication which you have made before me. I have consecrated this house, house which you have built my built by putting uh, my name there forever. And my eyes at um, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually." So then, people ask the question, "Well, how could God have said that?" If, uh, you know, not much longer, the temple would be destroyed. Well, there's a few things. First off, God God has moved his, his temple, if you will, to the body of believers. So in a sense, his name does dwell there forever. Second off, once again, God's talking about more than just physical places. Third off, he does give the qualification that if you follow me, which obviously some did and then others didn't. But yet God in his faithfulness still held up to to this by once again writing his name perpetually in the heart of the believers and in fact um, to some extent to the to the um, to Israelite people who will one day be saved so and we'll talk about um, uh, salvation that kind of stuff in the New Testament class um, so but we also see that God is holy in chapter 21 uh, verses 1 through 18 um, it talks about um, the vineyard, a uh, vineyard that Ahab pretty much steals. You know, and, and, and it, it is important to note that you know God is still God is still holy, and you know He is He is to be treated um, as holy. Uh, he has His ways of doing things, and um, you can't just write off those ways. Um, in the Um, in Second Kings, um, I think I, I, I'm, I'm. Excuse me, I, I did mess up. Uh, Naboth's vineyard does kind of prove the point or whatever, but um, I was actually referring to Second Kings uh, chapter 21, 1 through 18, and it talks about Manasseh uh, succeeding Hezekiah, um, and it and it says very clearly about you know God and, and what what Manasseh has done. And so it is important to remember that although people change, although principles change throughout time or whatever. Um, God's word remains, and who he is is unchanging. He is always the same, yesterday, today, and forever. And so while these people are, are, are forgetting and then remembering and they're forgetting, God is still there. He's still holy and he's still being faithful to them. So, But once again, how can you be faithful and, and, and allow that to happen? Well, because he is also holy. You know, God's love demands justice. So... Um, so why did why did uh, Assyria deport in Babylon too? Uh, usually it was to weaken their, the, a nation's uniqueness, take them away from their their homes so that they wouldn't rebel, make them feel out of their element, that kind of stuff. It'd take away what made them them. Um, but however, Second Kings ends with um, with a very strong hope. In twenty five twenty seven through thirty, we read that Jehoiakim, king of Judah who is the descendant of, da of King David, has been released um, from, from prison. And, and so this is like, ah, another reason why we know it, it was written before they came back from the exile, because he's pointed to the fact that Jehoiakim being released from prison is um, fulfillment partially of the promise and that there is hope coming. Um, so Israel was the only nation in covenant. Um, we already talked about that to a great extent. Um, also, I want to point out that God use, uh, judges those He uses to judge. Okay, God uses judges those He uses to judge. So, be really careful about drawing condemnation to uh, to, to people. Be real, really careful about that. 
Um, so um, the book of Psalms is, is really a, a, what can be called the song book of Israel. It, it, it's composed of five different smaller books, um, and it seems like there's no real set um, pattern for these books. There really is no um, rhyme or reason as to which song goes where. There have been a few theories, but nothing really concrete. Um, so who is it written by? A lot of people, really. Uh, David, Asaph, Korah, Moses, I think, wrote one. Uh, really, just a, a lot of people. Some people aren't even listed. Um, and and, and the, the theme of Psalms, I know people use it a lot for, for doctrine, but that's not necessarily its purpose. Um, Psalms is real life with real emotions. You know, a lot of times, especially in the church, we like to pretend like things aren't what they are. Oh no, th th it just seems like that, you know. Oh, you just feel depressed, but I rebuke that in Jesus' name. What? Well, well, now hold on. Um, there's a lot of reasons for depression, including a sinful lifestyle, um, including a, 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 a mental problem, including uh, past trauma, including, I mean, you go down the list, there's a lot of reasons, and sometimes life itself just gets us down. You know, so once again, and Psalms kind of glories in that. The fact that, that real people feeling real emotions in real life. And, and, it's un, and it's unhidden from God. And I think that's why so many people don't know how to, how to understand Psalms. is because they look at it in our modern culture where Christianity, Christians are supposed to have everything together. They can't, um, they can't reveal any of their weaknesses or anything like that. Um, and then you, they go to Psalms and it's like, oh no. How do we interpret this? And so they they kind of grasp onto certain ones like um, the Lord's uh, the the Lord is my shepherd in Psalm 23. Um, but then for other ones like on Psalm 137, I think where he says, "Take the babies and dash them against the stones." It's like, well, I, uh, metaphorical, you know. And it's like, well, no, it actually wasn't written to be a metaphor. Um, so um, it is important to notice that. Um, so when you're going through Psalms, take a step back and realize that these are people revealing how they feel about something. Okay, Not trying to teach doctrine, writing a song based off of how they feel. Um, and for that reason, Psalms is extremely beneficial in counseling. Um, very, very beneficial. But also, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it teaches us to be honest with God and to trust God. Because he sees anyways. He already knows your bad attitude. He already knows what you're doing. So you might as well be open with him. You know, Lord, I'm really struggling with this. Oh, I didn't know that. N no, I think God does know. Um, so there is something in Psalms for everyone, for every mood you're in. There's something there. Um, you know, you have some like Psalm 150 that are just so, seem so happy. Oh, praise the Lord. Then you see, see, see other ones that are, you can tell, are written in a time of struggle. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You know, you can just see this, 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 this inner fight almost. And um, so it was written over a great period of time, uh, probably started somewhere in the 14 or 1200s, um, and worked down to about 550s or so uh, BC still. Um, and uh, so that means it was written once again during the exile, um, or at least, you know, some of them were, because some of the psalms, one of the psalms at least was written during, during, the, and during Babylon. So, I mean, that would have had to have been sometime after 580. Um, and uh, so it was written over a long period of time. However, it could have been compiled sometime after they returned from um, Babylon. Now with that, we look at the different types of psalms that exist within the book itself. Now the first is called a hymn, um, which expresses praise and thanks. You can see that in Psalm 150. Where it says, "Hey, you know, bless the or praise the Lord, and in His sanctuary, in His mighty expanse, for His mighty deeds, His excellent greatness." You know, basically, what Psalm 150 says is, "Praise Him everywhere, and praise Him for what He's done and for who He is." You know, or you can just see, it's just it's a hymn, it's a praise, it's a praise chorus, a thanks chorus. Then there's what's called a repentant psalm, which this this expresses sorrow and appeal for grace. Okay, Psalm 51 is a good example of that. Um, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. This was after Nathan came to King David after his sin with Bathsheba. So you know, just kind of gives a little bit of a of a nice little setting for that. So 
Uh, the third type is what's called a wisdom psalm. And this doesn't really read like what we would think of as a psalm. It actually reads more like a series of Proverbs, almost like. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand on the paths of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Um, chapter 1 is what the one means. Um, so it just, it, it's just, it's, it's more observational. Really has these little pointers in there, and and remember, just like um, there are there's poetry and wisdom all throughout the Bible, the wisdom poetry is also found in a lot of the other ones. Um, just because they're we're breaking them up like this doesn't mean that they're always so clear and cut like that. Sometimes they're mixed up and um, you know have aspects of certain ones in certain places. Then there's what's called a royal psalm, and this has a focus on the king. In Psalm 2 it says, Why are the nations in an uproar, and the peoples devise a vain thing? And then down, um, down lower it says, um, The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart. Against the anointed. So once again, talking about, um, about the king. But then there's also one that's re really closely related to a royal psalm called a messianic psalm. And these have to do with Christ. Um, you may remember them, uh, but Psalm 2 is actually both a royal and a messianic. Um, and if you go down to Psalm 22, it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. And so although this is probably a repentant or a lament, it is also a, a messianic. See, because once again, that, that's exactly what Jesus said on the cross. So uh, this, this next one is what people really get confused with. It's called an imprecatory, okay? An imprecatory basically means that the psalmist is calling for judgment. Somebody has done something that the psalmist is irritated about, and irritated is a, a very weak word, but I hope you understand what I'm saying. Um, and, and so um, the psalmist is, is irritated, and, he, and he's calling out to the Lord. Um, Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon there we sat down and wept. When we remembered Zion, upon the willows in the midst of it we hung our harps. For there our captors demanded of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget her skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy, remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it to its very foundation. O daughter of Babylon, you devastated one. How blessed will be the one who repays you with the recompense with which you have repaid us. How blessed will be the one who seizes and dashes your little ones against the rocks. You just hear that imagery. We're talking about children being dashed against rocks. I mean, this is this is a terrible thing. But it's a call for judgment. These people had gone through a trauma. They had lost their homeland. A lot of times, scholars actually actually think that uh, this had happened to their children. But either way, we read in, in, in the prophets about how they were killed and and uh, you know different parts of the history books show that they were eating their little ones at parts. You know and and um, just just terrible things going on. And then the people of Babylon say, hey, sing us a song from your homeland. Yeah, can you say that was in, 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 being insensitive? <laughs> I don't think... Um I, I don't think that uh, the Babylonians knew about being sensitive, but anyways, especially to cultural bonds, I mean, goodness sakes, they hadn't even been a hundred years and they were they were going off about that. I don't think that would have gone in today's culture. <laughs> but... Um, but you know, you, you just it, it, the psalmist is being irritated, and we'll talk about. So, how do you understand an imprecatory psalm? How does it relate to us? We'll talk about it in just a second. But the last type of psalm is called a lament. Now, this has a lament, then it has an expressed trust, and then praise. And and pray. And Psalm three is a really good example of, of a lament psalm. Um, <clears throat> O oh Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising against me. So we're here we have the lament. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield upon me, about me, my glory and the one who lifts my head. I was crying, there, there is, there is praise. I, I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid. Arise, O oh Lord, save me, O oh God. There is the trust. 
So these diff three different elements are, are, are mixed around, and they may be in different orders, but it has the same three elements every time. A lament about what's going on, trust in the Lord, and praise for what he is doing or what he will do or what he has done. So how to understand these imprecatory psalms? Wow. Okay, so first off, don't quote them blindly. Okay, make sure you actually understand the psalm before you even reference it. A lot of times we quote out these psalms um, when they really have absolutely nothing to do with the situation. Understand books in their context, and then you can understand how they apply to you. So first off, understand it is from a human perspective. Okay, is it still inspired by the Lord? Yes, but it is from expressed from a human perspective. And uh, just because something is inspired by God does not mean that humanity is, is, is removed from it. If God wanted that, he would have given us, you know, a, a Bible from the sky. He wouldn't have used people to write it. But he didn't give us something from the sky. He, he, used, he, taught, he spoke through people, people like Paul and Mo, Moses, and, and, and gave them this. Okay? So second off, it, first off, it's, it's a human perspective. Second off, they are verbalizing real emotions that they felt. As a result usually of some tragedy that happened or something that happened to them, okay? Third, the psalmist realized their weaknesses, and rather than, ar than arming themselves and killing people, they lifted up a song instead to the Lord and, 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 and expressed how they felt to him. They realized that they were unable to do it of themselves, and that was a good thing. So next up, they were honest with God. They didn't hi hide how they felt. They trusted God to fix it. They wrote a song about how irritated they were to release their emotions, but then they left it in God's hand. Sometimes we need to do the same thing. We try to we, we try to just move past hurt. When oftentimes you have to go to the temple. Let, let me give you an example. In Leviticus 12, it says about how the woman who's who's had a baby needs to, you know, take however much time off, and then she needs to go and give this sacrifice at the at the temple before she can she can be accepted back in. Well, it's the exact same thing with us. When we've gone through a trauma, we need to we need to come to the Lord with, with, with worshiping before we're allowed back in, lest everything that we touch get contaminated. We'll try to witness to people, and it won't work. We'll try to be there for the for the body, and we, we won't really be there because up here we still have pain. We haven't gone to the Lord with with, with our sacrifice, with our offering of our heart, and in not doing that, we are unable. To be, to be healed and to, to be used to our full benefit. So trust God to fix it. And then lastly, it is still inspired by the Holy Spirit, but you have to study it differently. You know, you can't just read everything blindly and literally in the Bible. You can't. You have to read it in its context and understand that there's different types of writing. Some things are poetry and are just being poetical. I know it mentions in one of the prophets about how the trees shook their shook their hands or something like that. Well, the trees didn't really have hands and they weren't really shaking them. It was probably the wind. See what I mean? But it's imagery. You see what I mean? It, 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 it's about describing something in a, in a more detailed, beautiful way. Um, not necessarily to be taken for literal. So... Um, that takes us to the end of the discussion about this, and consequently the end of the time of the exile. In next lesson, we'll be looking at what happened after that, what happened after Babylon. Um, and then with the New Testament class, we'll pick up with well, what happened from the end of the Old Testament to the beginning of the New Testament. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this, and uh, tune in next time.